you turn around. Okay, Doc. All right, so hello everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we're going to get started, but first I just want to let everyone know that this interview will be recorded. If you're uncomfortable with that in any way, feel free to turn your video camera off. Um, please remember to donate night tonight if you can. All of the proceeds will go to our artists. And without further ado, I will ha hand things over to our interviewer for the night, Mike McDermott. All right, thank you so much. Hey. Um, thank you so much for being here for, I think it's like the eighth um, Lundy Legend interview we've done so far. Um, as always, it's always been a blessing to be able to take part of these and give up, hear the voices and stories from those who lived um, in the area that we know uh, and hear very little about. So I'm very happy to be part of JSX's kind of goal to kind of give voice to that generation. And so without further ado, our guest of honor tonight, Ms. Maxine Simmons, who started her life as a dancer at the age of three through tap and ballet, discovered Lindy Hop at 15 by attending a workshop held by Mama Lou Parks. From there, she placed third twice at the Harvest Moon Ball, and by 17, she was a professional dancer. Maxine began to spread the joys of dance and Lindy Hop up and down the East Coast in Canada with her fellow parquettes. And Maxine continued to develop her love for dance by studying jazz, modern, African, and even Latin dances. Today, she continues to teach the next generation of Lindy Hoppers, sharing her wisdom and passion for this dance. And so without further ado, uh, can you please unmute yourselves and please welcome Miss Maxine Simmons. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you, Mike. Wow. What an intro. Wow. How are you doing today, Maxine? I am wonderful. I'm doing really well. Thank you for asking and yourself. Oh, of course, of course. We're doing well, too. Uh, I guess a quick um, shout out to um, some guests in the audience. Um, Ms. Crystal Johnson, who was our first interviewer. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And unfortunately, uh, due to some internet difficulties, uh, Ms. Barbara Billups was planning on showing up tonight, but uh, I think Verizon is down where she is. So she sends her best wishes and her oh, support to all of us as well. So wish her the best for and thank you for her support. But so uh, back to you, uh, person of the day, Maxine, could you just tell us um, kind of what's kind of your start into dance? Like, uh, my start into dance is at the very beginning, it's start time dancing school. Going there every Saturday morning, my grandfather would take me or my grandmother, whoever was available to take me, would take me Saturday mornings, that was my life. I got up, uh, first class was tap, second class was um, ballet. And from there, we would go downstairs to the luncheonette and I'd get a ice cream soda, a BLT sandwich and, or, or a hamburger and the rest is history. Could you tell us a bit more about kind of what the Star Time Academy was? Yeah, I, I, from going back over, my pictures, it was Star Time TV Studios. So we were being trained to be entertainers. Okay, and um, we held, our recitals was held at Carnegie Hall. So I danced on Carnegie Hall stage. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. So um, yeah. That's what it is. And right now to this day, um, the school was in the at Sullivan Theater, which is now still the theater that Stephen Corbet holds his show at, um, his late night show on CBS. So, yep, that's where I went for the first, oh gosh, maybe 10 years of my childhood. Awesome. So, and, that, and you said you started at like the age of three was when three. you first started dancing. Three That's years awesome. Old. Now, um, from kind of let's go even earlier to kind of the place of your birth, because I know when we initially talked, um, I, I asked you, it was like, I, you were from New York, right? And you said, no, I'm from Harlem. Exactly. Uh, can, you, can you tell us why um, that's such a distinction to you? Why um, 
being from Harlem is such is so different from being from New York? Well, okay. So it's just like folks will say, um, you're from New York. Uh, New York is a really large state. Um, even to break it down even more, you say, um, oh, I'm from New York City. And say, okay, where's New York City? People don't think of New, even New York City, they still may be bringing in upstate New York or someplace else. When you say I'm from New York, you either from the Isle, Manhattan or one of the five girls, when you say you're from New York City. So even within that umbrella, no, I'm from Harlem. Okay, let's be very specific because especially for African-Americans coming, migrating to the North back then, you came to Harlem or you went to Brooklyn. So I am happen to be from Harlem. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like uh, growing up in Harlem? Yeah, it was beautiful. It was a very, very exciting time growing up in Harlem. I'm a child of the 50s, grew up in the 50s and the 60s. And it was very vibrant, um, very exciting. Uh, a lot of activity going on. Um, we've always had our, I guess you say our entertainment life. And I really grew up in the shadows of the Apollo theater. Uh, Apollo has always been on a uh, 125th street. It used to be a burlesque theater going back really many, 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 many years ago. And then the Schiffman brothers purchased it and they turned it into a showcase where they brought in um, live entertainment. Well, Burlesque was live entertainment, but I guess mainstream <laughs> entertainment at that time. So um, there was a lot of, it was just flourishing, um, just a lot of activity going on. Um, folks, it, it was a happy time, very harmonious and especially by the time we got to the 60s because things were changing, culture was changing, black power, black and I'm proud and Harlem's always been the mecca of entertainment. So anybody who was anybody lived in Harlem and it was or either came here to perform in, in Harlem, even if they were known act um, from another state, everybody wanted to play the Apollo Theater. And even once they played the Apollo Theater, during the day, time, week, it would be, it was just commonplace to see these famous people that, you know, walking down the street, everybody interact, intermingled personally, I saw Malcolm X, okay? We would see Malcolm X on um, 7th Avenue over there at the um, Teresa Hotel. That was a, a, a big thing at that time because um, Castro, Fidel Castro came to New York and it was, came to the United States and they wouldn't let him stay in Washington. So he says, you know what? I'm gonna stay uptown in Harlem and he stayed at the um, Teresa Hotel. And so that became a, a landmark. And if any day, especially on the, on the weekend, so like on Saturday, they would have maybe a podium or a stand and our leaders at that time would be out there, you know, um, telling us, you know, keeping us aware of what's going on. But it was a very thriving time. People were moving, productive, entertainment was alive. It was just a brilliant time. I had a very, my childhood of it was, if I could put it like this, I just couldn't wait to grow up. You know, because it seemed like the adults were having way too much fun. Um, Jackie Robinson, um, 
Roy Campanella, um, Joe Lewis. It was so much was going on. And anybody who was anybody came to Harlem. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so going back to your time, uh, you started as dancing. Um, we actually have some photos that you sent to me that I'm going to try and uh, get up on the screen. But so you started at the age of three. Uh, so obviously, you know, your family were the ones that, you know, kind of got you into dancing. Uh, right. Why did they push you to be a dancer at such an early age? That's what you, well, they did. Um, it was part of our education. Um, as I had mentioned before, my um, grandparents were um, working middle-class people. My grandfather was a Pullman on the railroad and he traveled um, from New York to Chicago. And my grandparents lived up on what they call Sugar Hill. And now Harlem, stretches from 110th Street to 155th Street, and it goes from river to river. That's the East River and the Hudson River. And as you come up from east to west, it goes up an incline and it's a hill. And it's, they called that area up on top, they called it Sugar Hill. And again, the more affluent um, folks lived up on Sugar Hill. Uh, not to say that affluent people didn't live down on in the valley, and they called the 7th, 8th, and Lenox Avenue. That was called the valley. Um, we had a section called Driver's Row, which to this day is a historical area. There were several historical areas in Harlem. Astor's Row, um, the daughter of um, Astor, over there off of Lenox Avenue and 129th Street. And if you go there to this day, they still really have the mm -hmm. buildings there. But getting back to up on the hill, the cultural scene up there was that if you, even if you couldn't afford it, um, you always found the way to, you wanted your children to have the best and to be exposed. And music and the arts was, always paramount, I guess, in our families. So you, if your family could afford it, you took dance lessons, piano lessons, violin lessons, singing lessons, or whatever. Um, Edgecombe Avenue, as I mentioned to you before, just to name drop just a little bit, um, Leslie Uggams, lived on um, Edgecombe Avenue. Diana Carroll lived on 152nd Street off of Amsterdam Avenue. Um, Ruby D. Ozzy Davis lived on um, Edgecombe Avenue. And it was just, again, part of the cultural scene. You know, folks were living at that time. They were thriving, they were doing elegant things, they were educating themselves. They almost like they were moving on up like George and Weezy <laughs> back at that time. Awesome, awesome. All right, so I'm gonna try and get uh, these photos up on the screen. Oh. Okay, I guess and that says that you're, you can see a, uh, I can. <laughs> oh, awesome. So this is you at uh, the Star Time Academy. And what kind of dances did you learn from there? That was tap dance. Tap dance? That was tap, yeah. And that was uh, the next year. And that was at another recital. Um, the schools had a recital, every an annual recital. You practice all year long, and then you had an annual recital. Our annual recitals were always in the in the springtime. Awesome, awesome. Let's see what else we got. Uh, I that think was, that's from the. That's the group. The, yeah, yeah, it's your entire class. Yeah, see the students in review. <laughs> <laughs> we were all review. And when did you? Um, you said you you performed at Carnegie Hall. 
Yeah. Uh, do, you remember, do you remember the night of that performance? Does that stick out to you? Um, you know, believe it or not, the part that sticks out to me, um, and this is, sounds going to sound so funny, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, your, your, your dancing shoes, all right, and your costumes. And I remember having to go, well, my grandparents, having to find the silver, the silver dye or the silver spray, it was paint, I don't think it was spraying at that time, but the silver polish to put on the tap dancing shoes. And that always sort of stood out because I can picture my grandmother or my grandfather preparing my shoes, you know, for the recital. And go, of course, going in and being fitted for the costumes, you know, someone made them. As you can see, we're all dressed in the same. <laughs> Your parents didn't make them. At the mm -hmm. studio, they had um, costume makers to make our costumes for us. So do I remember that? Yeah, I remember, yeah. Awesome, awesome. So you did this from like eight, from like at age three to around 15, because at 15 is when you finally got exposed to Lindy Hop. Well, okay, so I danced at that studio from age, I would say three to 10, and then mm -hmm. from 10 to 15, I was at another school. I was going to a dance school in Harlem called um, Mabel Hart, H-A-R-T. I was now going to her dancing school, which was on 138th Street and 7th Avenue and still taking piano lessons upstairs. It was a building and it was a musical building. I think on another floor, kids in there were playing um, violin. And of course, by this time I'm in school, junior high school. So I was in my dance class, glee club, drama class, any kind of performing art after school program, I was in it. I did something every day after school and on Saturdays, just about all my life. The only mm -hmm. time, the only day I didn't do perform or do something, it was on Sunday. Sunday I went to church. With <laughs> my phone, you had to go to church. <laughs> awesome. Uh, can you tell us about uh, the first time you're exposed to Lindy Hop? Yes. So. Um, I was having this conversation with Crystal, I was trying to find out who took me to this, my very first meeting with uh, Mama Lou Parks. It was the summertime, it was in July, and I finally figured it out. It was David Butts, and I think you're gonna interview him um, in the future, if not next, next month, yes. Okay, David and I happened to wind up in living in the same building in Harlem. As a matter of fact, we lived um, right around the corner from still to this day is Sylvia's restaurant. At the time it was not Sylvia's restaurant, but the restaurant was that is there to this day was there then. Um, we were in the building and you know, he, you know, he was a neighbor and he knew that I danced, you know, cause you know, everybody knows who's who in the building and what you do. And you see this person going out on Saturday morning or, you know, with their little bags and, oh, you dance, oh, okay. So he invites me over to uh, a practice, which was being held at, um, in a public school. Uh, I think PS 98, PS 94, it was PS something, but it was right off of um, between Lenox and 7th Avenue. And I go into this summertime, hot, sweaty, just hot. And it's a auditorium, it was a, a gymnasium. And there's people there. One of the first things I saw were the parkettes. These were the ladies that I had seen on the wall in a picture at the Apollo Theater and never in my wildest dreams would I ever imagine that I would see them face to face. So as uh, soon as I walked in, I was in awe and starstruck. And I just probably stood there with my mouth open and David, 
who knew that he was dancing. I didn't know he was a parkhead. I, I didn't know. So um, there were folks there my age, a little older, and then, like I said, the older guys and David and his crew. And um, he introduced me to Mama Lou Parks and he told her, oh, she can dance. And she said, oh, you can, oh yeah. What kind of dance do you do? I'm like, oh, you know, I take tap and ballet and blah, blah, blah. She said, oh, okay, can you do this? I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> so that was pretty much my introduction, just like that. And um, one thing, having a dance, background, I could learn. I learned quickly. So, and from that day on, the rest is really history. I always say, I've always felt like I was drafted into, at that point, we weren't the parkettes. At that point, it was like, they were practicing for the Harvest Moon Ball. This was July and the Harvest Moon Ball is in, um, always was held in, in September, Harvest Moon. So it was like, okay, I just went along with the program, fell into the flow and went along with the program. And even that first September that I participated in the contest, I was just going along. I, I could not care. I was just like happy as a, a, a bee in the honey hive. I wasn't concerned about, it, not that I wasn't concerned about winning. I just, I was okay. I was just okay. Just go out and contest. It was just having fun. Just go out there and have fun. And that's what I did. Unbeknown to me, I came in third place. And then that's when I started taking the food. I'm like, oh, 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 okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so that was that September. Um, going into that fall, I went back to my other programs because I was in um, going to Kennedy Center and uh, back in Harlem at that time, there were a lot of programs for the youth at that time. There was the PAL, there was Kennedy Center the Boys and Girls Club and um, Salvation Army ran a program. I happened to live near Kennedy Center. So I attended Kennedy Center and I was in, in their dance program. And there I met um, Shaniqua Baker. She was a student with and performer with Alvin Ailey, but she held dance classes at Kennedy Center. So now here, you know, during the winter months, I was doing back to my, you know, um, modern dance, African dance, and until springtime. Of course, they Kennedy Center they had their own recitals, you know, because that's what you, that's all you do. You practice, you learn things, you practice, and of course you got to showcase it. So every time you're in a dance class group, um, that type of structure there's gonna be some kind of show. So um, going back into that next spring, that next summer now, now I'm really all get back in, you know, dance, you know, oh, now it's back to Mama Lou Parks, back to dancing and stuff. Now by this time, Crystal maybe will remember this, Mama Lou would have um, rehearsals at her place. She lived up in the Bronx and she lived in a sub level and um, she had a patio outside. Now here it is, summertime, July, hot. And she had a patio outside and we didn't have air conditioners back at that time. We had fans and open windows. And we would go up there on a Saturday, you would get there early, like about 12.30, one o'clock and you would rehearse all day in that sun out in the back on that patio. And this is how you learn how to do your air steps and your flips because one thing you didn't want to do, you did not want your butt to hit that concrete because you're behind hit that concrete, you was going to get burned. You was going to get burned. You was going to get hurt. You're going to scar up. And so we learned under those conditions and 
again, Mama Lou, she would cook and she would have food. We would literally spend the whole day there. And um, part of that, we would start um, getting costumes together, talking about costumes, who's gonna wear this, who's gonna wear what. And as now we're really preparing for the contest again, coming up in September. So as time would go along, now you're getting fitted for your costume. Once the costume is made, you gotta dance in the costume to make sure it's gonna stay together. It's not gonna fall apart and stuff like that. Then so that was our life, you know, that, that's the life we lived. You know, and then it was time to go back for the contest. Now this time I was a little bit, oh, and I wanted to win. Now this time really, no, this time, the other time I was just there. I was totally oblivious just being there. And I said, Harvest Moon Ball was um, held in the old, the old Madison Square Garden. Tell you about Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden to us, going with, in the old one, back in the day, they would help, they had the, um, the circus, the circus comes to town. So that was always the biggest thing in the summertime in New York, um, the circus would come to town, Bonham and Bailey Circus, okay. So the circus left and I think the very next attraction at Madison Square Garden would be the Harvest Moon Ball. The Harvest Moon Ball was a really big to do in New York at that time. You had all the different genres of dance. You had the, um, oh gosh, ballroom dancing, tango. Um, oh gosh, I'm drawing blanks. Any kind of dance and every, polka, that's what I was trying to say. Polka, every dance genre that there was, they held this, you know, they had, uh, it was ran by the Daily News, the Daily News Harvest Moon Ball. So it was a pretty big something to do. And as I said, by that, the next time I came into it and was preparing for it, I was excited about that. Um, I remember you had asked me about how was it to be at the Harvest Moon Ball? And it was just exciting. Again, it was very exciting um, when you, first go into the, the building and you're into the holding area to your time to go on stage to your your genre of, that's the right term, of dance is going on because each group had their own segment and they would have the wall segment, the polka segment, the cha-cha, the Latin, um, tango. Okay, and then it was boom. Jitter, you know, the, the jitterbug jive, which always stimulated the most excitement, okay? Because we were doing the acrobatics. So um, everybody had their corner. I mean, it was a massive room, you know, everybody corner and everybody's getting dolled up, looking, everyone's helping everybody, even though the different groups and you peep out through the curtain and you could see, and then it was next, it was your time to go out there. And I remember Mike, you asked me what was one of the things um, that stuck out to me. <laughs> I always told you, going in after the circus, it always still had the smell of the circus. You know, you could always still smell the elephants. <laughs> you could always still smell whatever was in there. Still, you could smell a little of the popcorn and a little of the um, cotton candy once you were in the holding areas. Once you got into the arena, I guess nothing really ever mattered then. And so now I'm participating in the Horace Moon Bowl for the second time. And I came in third again, and um, which was okay with me. Um, the person who came in first, she was part of our group because there was a couple of groups from other different boroughs. Um, she was a strong dancer. I already knew she was a strong dancer. You know, everyone has their strengths. And I was just happy to be in, in the first three. So once again, I came out there fine. And, and, and it was, again, a happy time. Your family came, your friends came after the show. You know, they're giving you flowers and whatever. And everybody goes eat, and, you know, go out to eat. 
and it was a happy time and a happy place. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, you just answered a list of questions that I have uh, without me having to ask them. So okay. it made my job a lot easier. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I missed something. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, I guess just real quick. Uh, so you competed in 64 and 65. Right. Um, who, do you remember who won those years? No. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not the first year. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Not. I told you, I was just there. Yeah. I could, I was like, I'm just here. I was <laughs> here. And um, I vaguely remember T. Yeah, I remember her name was, we called her T. And she won with Dickie. Yeah. She came in first place. And she was an excellent dancer, beautiful form. Just beautiful. I mean, I'm leaving. I would, if I came in first place, I would give her my prize because no, you <laughs> won first place. No, because she she was an excellent dancer. Her and Dickie, oh yeah, they threw down. Awesome, they, awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, so going back to that first year, um, kind of where you know you, you said you were just there. Um, that was only like two months after your two or three months after you got first exposed to Lindy Hop. Mm -hmm. What was it about Lindy Hop or Mama Lou Parks? that made you wanna hit the ground running so fast where in three months you're, at, you're on the world stage of this dance? It was exciting for me. I had never done that type of dance before. You gotta understand, I came, my dance up until that point was always a little bit more structured. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, you get out there I remember doing the dance of the wooden soldiers and stuff like that. And I was doing a lot of now, and, and this is my word that I, I could use a little robotic, but um, Lindy was a little, it was a lot freer, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, a whole lot, and a lot more fun. And definitely you don't really, well, we, I wasn't doing any kind of air steps doing no tap dancing not doing no shuffle, shuffle along down the Buffalo, you know, shuffle the Buffalo. No, 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 no. So um, yeah, it, I, I was doing acrobatics. I was being thrown up in the air. I was being flipped around and coming up under the legs and stuff like that. And this was a dance that I've seen on television, you know, and, and here I am doing it. I was in, I was in awe and I'm like, Wow, look at me, I'm doing this. Wow, this is so wow. Yeah. 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 By that second year, I was like, oh, okay. I thought I was hot stuff there. I'll keep this rated G. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll just we'll edit the video afterwards if anything slips. Don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, could you tell us, can you kind of like compare and contrast? Um either the way Lindy Hop was taught or even Mama Lou's own specific style of Lindy Hop compared to kind of the other structured style of dances that you were taught previously? Well, I don't know any other way. I don't even know Mama Lou's Lindy Hop. Okay, so I only know what she taught us and what, Sullivan, the older guys, the instructors at that time, they were past champions, all of them, each and every one of them. That was um, Sullivan and Shook and all the rest of them, Sonny and all of them. So I only know that Lindy Hop um, different from Dance structure, Marmalou Parks. Mm. Or maybe I like didn't comparing I didn't, it. I, I didn't have her to compare. I didn't have anyone else to compare her to. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm. I guess I'm trying to ask. I'm um, comparing how Lindy Hop was taught versus maybe like how tap or jazz was taught. Uh, the other the other styles of dance were taught before. Like, how was Lindy Hop? Because you used the word structure, like the structure dances. Mm -hmm. um, like, how was Mama Lou's dance? teaching style for the stance? Like, how were you guys taught? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 
someone gets in front of you and they do da 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 whatever that and you do it <laughs> whereas okay in dancing school they had steps had specific names like you do a time step that's your basic tap dance step ba da da ba da da time step double time step you know, triple time step, da, 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 da. And your performance basically consists of all the steps that you've learned during class, and then you just string them along together some kind of way to put them on a production. Uh, Mama Lou's, it was do this, you know, someone will get out there and I want you to learn this. And, and that's how it was taught. A lot of the subs didn't have names, specific names. I have someone that's gonna pass me in a minute, so. It's all good. Okay, so go ahead. <laughs> that's all good. Um, all right, awesome. So uh, post two years, uh, two third place Hearts and World Championships under your belt. Uh, when did you start going on the road as one of the parkettes? Actually, so okay. you started as a junior parkette first, correct? As a matter of fact, um, again, I was discussing this with Crystal and just brought it to realize, as it says, we were, the four of us, as a result of the Harvest Moon Ball, um, the four ladies came out. It was myself, Crystal, Laverne, and T. We are were and are to this day, the original junior parkettes. We, there were never a junior parkettes until us. We were the very first junior parkettes. So it was after that um, second competition, I started dancing, doing shows with Mama Lou Parks under the parkettes at that time, going into that winter. Cause um, there was always shows going on in um, in Harlem. I mean, we had clubs here. There, not only the Apollo Theater. There was the Palms Cafe. There was um, Showman's. Showman's was more of a, a jazz club. There was um, the Rennie Ballroom. Um, I don't know if I said um, the basketball player Wilt Chamberlain had a club. It was called Small's Paradise. That was a really big popular place. Anybody who's who came up to Will Chamberlain's club and it was a cabaret in the um, back, you know, really big elaborate bar, really lovely in the front. And in the middle there was a band, but in the back there was a full stage there set up just really magnificent. Um, so there was always shows going on and it was always, you know, we were in demand by then. You know, the parkettes were in demand and now having the junior parkettes, uh, Mama Lou Park could also, um, she could take on more, more jobs, you know, more, um, more shows. Could you describe some of the shows that you were a part of? Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, let's just start at the top. <laughs> uh, I'm go, I'm maybe sort of jump straight from that fall straight into that summertime. Um, in the 60s, man, Motown. Motown was it. Are, are you kidding? Oh, my gosh. This was... The Motown Review would roll into town and the word had went out that, you know, um, the Apollo was doing more showcasing shows. Well, there was always shows there. I mean, um, you had um, Honey Cole. Honey Cole happened to be a tap dancer. He was the MC of the show. And again, um, everybody and all of us, everybody, Apollo was the mecca of entertainment in Harlem. Our families, parents went to shows there. As children, they took us to see shows there. Um, we were always taken to a matinee 
and or you can go in and see the matinee and you can stay there all day and catch all three shows. You had a matinee and two evening shows. So, um, but getting back to when we started and I think Crystal and I, the parkheads were on, I don't know, but somehow we were chosen to be part of this, the show for the Motown Review. And this was the show. I made some notes to make sure I didn't forget nobody. Um, the Motown Review was the Miracles, the Temptations, the Marvelettes, Martha Reed and the Vandellas and uh, Mary Wells. And then the next time it came in, um, it was um, the Supremes wasn't even the Supremes at that time. They were, they just, as a matter of fact, they weren't even the show, they weren't even that high on the bill. The, at that time, I believe the Marvelettes were the, like the real big girl, um, female act at that time. So, and those are the pictures. You have the pictures of Crystal and I on I'll stage, Smokey Robinson. Yeah, um, that was the beginning of really, that's when for me, I was like, I'm in showbiz, what? <laughs> that was it for me, I'm like, I'm in showbiz, yeah. And it was, it was a magical, magical, magical time. Can you imagine being like 17 years old and you really sp supposed to have been maybe a year older to be there? Cause I could remember Bobby Schiffman, the owner of the theater, when we got, went in for the, um, uh, you had to go in for rehearsal and he always came to the rehearsals. Rehearsal was always under the, um, in the Apollo, downstairs and he would come in and Mama Lou was there and we were all there and we were rehearsing and he would come and he would look down he would look and he would like mm -hmm. and she would say oh yeah well these are these are my new girls and da, 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 da. yeah how old are these girls and, oh she's 18 <laughs> she said, if he asks you how old you are you tell him you 18 I'm like okay so um he came and says how old are you? I said, you know, 18. I said a little bit more convincing than that. <laughs> said, uh, oh, okay. You know, and he did just like this. He says, young lady, he says, you say you're 18. He says, I don't know about that. He says, but as long as you don't step out of line, you don't have no problem with me. But the first time you step out of line, you out of here. I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, okay. But and the rest is history. And again, working those shows that first summer, it was just magical. I mean, just magical. Uh, you know, it's one thing to see the stage performance and the because you got to remember, we all get together for rehearsals. There was always rehearsals, light and sound and this. They were always back. And being the Motown Review, it was just magical. Our dressing room, we had the crows, the crow's nest. Oh, my gosh. It was at the very top of the theater, and it was a walk-up. And um, the dressing room, you know, cramp and small, but you were just happy. You were just happy to be there. And, you know, the stage, you get that knock on the door, you come in and knock on the door. 10 minutes, showtime. Showtime, the butterflies in your stomach and, you know, and, and here we go. And we opened up. The dancers always open up the show. You know, you came out there, boom, 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 boom. You dance, you and do, and um, Lindy was always a showstopper. So you came out there and boom, boom, flip, flop, and you warming up the audience. And I, now the audience is getting warm. They happy. They see you, pretty girls. You know, dancing, music. And then I guess the next thing that came out would be like maybe you always like had a. There was always a communion on the show, always. 
comedian comes on the show, he does this, and now you have the acts. They come on, you know, one by one, you know, until they get up to the top. And it was just magical. And in between shows, we would um, we'd be up and down the stairs, in and out of each other's dressing room. I remember the day, <laughs> I, re I remember the day <laughs> we were in the dressing room and you know, it's a knock on the door. And I happened to be sitting at the dressing table. And I think there would be two in that particular room it was two. It's knock on the door and the door is right here at my left. And because I was the closest, uh, you know, Maxine opened the door, you know, knocked a couple of times and like, you know, I'm young, I'm not gonna open the door. So one of the older girls, I think it might've been Gigi, I uh, said, uh, Maxine, open the door. I was like, oh, okay. Right. Open up the door. And I'm face to face. I mean, face to face like this to Smokey Robinson. And I like, I was like a deer in the headlights. I mean, a deer in the headlights. And of course, this is, we're in between shows. So we're like in bathrobes, hair, you know, the guys at the time, because the guys were wearing those hairstyles and you know, have the hair tied up and we had our ponytails tied up too and everything. So everybody's tied up, you know, probably half makeup, half on, half off and everything. And I'm just standing there and I'm just like, and he looks at me and he says, I guess he wanted to talk to, I think Gloria, whoever. Cause of course the older, the original, the, the senior park heads, they all knew each other and, and everything. So he asked for whoever he asked for. And I just stood there and I remember her coming up. She's like, girl, what's the matter with you? Move, let him inside. And he came inside and she said, girl, shut your mouth. You're going to get flies. She did my mouth. She said, shut your mouth. You're going to get flies. And it, it was just a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Again, in between the shows, we would go and we would sit down in their dressing rooms. And the guys always, all the acts, the girls, the Marvelettes, everybody, they knew we were younger and they really protected us. They embraced us. They sort of like took us under their wings. They treated us nice. You okay, you want anything? You know, food, you know, to go out, food, Fried chicken was a big thing, you know, and Chinese food. There was always food in the back and everything. So um, as we're sitting in the dressing rooms, you know, folks are talking. Someone over there in the corner is playing cards. Someone over there is sitting, maybe strumming on a, a guitar. Someone's over there talking over. And Smokey had came upstairs really to go over. He wanted to make a change in um, one of the performances, you know. Um, so that's why he came up there. But there was always a lot of activities when anybody who sees a show, there's always a, a zillion things going on behind stage and behind the scenes. And again, um, they were very nurturing and I remember Smokey saying to me, you know, yeah, you just, you know, just, you know, just don't get caught up in all this glitter and glitz, you know, cause all that glitter isn't gold. He said that, he said that to me, all that glitter isn't gold. And I remember that to this day. That's awesome. Um, a quick note just for um, the audience. Um, if you have any questions, for uh, Maxine, uh, we will set a time uh, to aside some time um, at the end. So if you have any questions, you know, you just put them in the chat for now, and we'll get to them at some points. But okay. so, uh, uh, Maxine, uh, when we when we talked um, earlier, you described like uh, when you're performing Lindy Hop, it was Lindy Hop is almost treated as like a novelty act. Can True. you kind of can you tell us kind of what that meant or what that means? Yeah. It, I it, it's exciting because it's, it, there's the acrobatics to it. That's what makes it so different. There's the acrobatics. You're doing, you're doing things that the regular Joe average person is not going out there on the dance floor doing. 
everyone that goes out into the dance, I don't care who, what, where, everybody's not being flipped up in the air, whipped around, thrown over, coming up under the legs. So, you know, it's the ooh and ah and whoa, you know? It was always, it's, it's a thrill. It's exciting to see something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it, did it surprise you or did it make sense to you that Lindy Hop nowadays is being taught all over the world, um, has gained a sort of popularity and notoriety where a, a, a recent music video involving Lindy Hop has reached the top 20 in certain charts. Does that surprise you or does it make sense that Lindy Hop has gotten, could get so popular? It doesn't surprise me. As a matter of fact, it makes me very happy to see that this dance style and form is having its own place. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. As it deserves. And it shouldn't have been treated like a, a, a stepchild uh, or just a passing fad. Most dances, let's face it, are, are a fad. You remember, there was the twist. There was the swim. There was, you know, there's the fats and stuff like that. But Lindy Hop was part and rooted in culture. You know, it's as jazz is to jazz, Lindy Hop is to Lindy Hop. So for it to be being revitalized, it's a good thing. I really would like it to be, I see it happening and I feel it started really coming from Europe into the United States over the past several years um, to see, and once again, to see more young folks being taught this dance style again, especially in the black community, since it is so deeply rooted into our culture. Awesome. Uh, so you do have some uh, recent experience of teaching more uh, of modern day Lindy Hoppers. What advice do you give to those dancers when you're teaching them routines? What advice? Or what values are you, would you like, do you try to get across to them? Well, we're not really at the values. Um, it's mm -hmm. more just you can't have, you have to be fearless. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you, can't, you, can't be, you can't be scared and dance Lindy Hop. You gotta be all, you got this, you either in it or you're not in it. You can't be half stepping. And um, you just gotta go for it. Um, and love what you do. You know, really, if you have a passion for it, it's just like anything you have a passion for, you're just gonna embrace it and do it a uh, hundred times better. And it's really, it, and, it, and it is really so much fun. And let alone, I mean, in this day and age, we are so um, couch potatoes and it's good that we need to get up and, and, and dance more and dance dance. I, I don't know what it is that these kids do, especially once we got to uh, break dancing, don't get me wrong. I, I, you know, I'm sure there's break dancers, famous break dancers, and I don't know what it is that they do now. I, I don't even, I don't know what the trend is, but um, yeah. Um, there's going to be, uh, it's, it's all part of not only our culture, but the culture of culture of dance itself. You know what I'm when, um, uh, when we talked um, earlier, we kind of talked about, you know, your generation growing up as a Lindy Hopper was in the 60s. And we kind of talked about how, you know, how different it was from those that danced during the swing era. And the biggest change, of course, was the music. Could you uh, kind of tell us how, because uh, you've obviously seen, you know, like the you know, Norma Miller's era of dancers, you know, the Hell's Poppin' days, uh, right. how the music influenced your guys' 
style of Wendy Hop? I think um, they were dancing to live music. Well, if I say, going back to the big band era, they were performing with the big bands. Okay, I'm going back to the Count Basies, the Duke Ellingtons, and the rest of those guys, and the Jitterbug Jive, and it was just a different time. Music, the beat was even, I, even believe me, I, I did take piano lessons. <laughs> With the counts and the beats, it was just more. It was faster. Okay, by the time we started dancing, it wasn't as fast. Maybe they, we were, say if they were doing a 16 count, we were only doing a 12 count. I mean, that's the best way that I can explain it using numbers. We weren't dancing at that accelerated level the way they were. Mm -hmm. Because when you see some of them, they were flying. You know, they put the hop in Lindy Hop, okay? So when we came in, we were there. Now, I think we had said, how do I compare that to swing dance? And some of the dancing that they are calling that I see some of the guys doing, they're calling it Lindy Hop. To me, it's just, no, y'all are just really swing dancing. Y'all may think you're Lindy Hopping, but all y'all are really doing is swing dancing. I don't care how fast you do it, you're still doing swing dance. Okay, Lindy Hop, incorporates the acrobatics and the acrobat there's more acrobatics than the dance okay you that's how i really differentiate lindy hop and swing okay uh as your time as a professional dancer even when you weren't a professional time you, you know stepped away as a professional dancer um you know you talk about how rigorous your schedule was was there time um that spent at all on social dancing or was it mainly just practice, performance, and competitions for you? When you say social dance, you mean like just going out and just having a good time? <sighs> yeah, all the time. Are you kidding? <laughs> Every, yeah, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I mean, this is all we do. Even when we are not dancing professionally, when you hit music, that's it. You know, it doesn't have to be a Friday night, a Saturday night, or whatever. When the music is playing and it moves that body, you are there. You start dancing. I do it now, today. So I can just play in whatever's on the playlist and something will come on up and you just go. And you, and you do what you know, okay? You, you never forget your steps. And it's one thing about Lindy Hop, you, you never forget those steps. I mean, I could, I, I would be able to do this forever, you know, and break forever. I may not be able to do the air steps or whatever, okay? But everything that I know comes into my social dance. Do I Lindy Hop in my social dance? Uh, no, not not really, because the music is that type of music it's in playing. But when you're a dancer, you dance. You could be in the supermarket and something that whatever that tune is that'll come that's being piped in. It happened today, you know, like it was a, a Michael Jackson came on the day and I was waiting. I might have been in Starbucks and I was waiting, you know, and I'm that's what you do. <laughs> you dance, and, and 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 you know what? It's a, it's a lot of fun too, uh, especially when the dancers who have danced together uh, together, and like we're out just having a good time, and we may be at a party, you know, somebody's birthday or whatever the event is, and you know that song will come on and be like ah ah. Next thing you know, the three of us are out there, the four of us are out there, and then you break into that routine. It's it, it is, is as natural as breathing. 
So does it come into your every, even into just your personal social dancing? Yes, it does. Are we awesome. going to be flipping and throwing each other? No. <laughs> I didn't come dressed for that today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. What's your go-to Lindy Hop song? Oh, gosh. Um, I guess... My kids, it's always dun 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 dun. Is that jumping at the Savoy? Yeah, it must be jumping at the Savoy. That's a classic. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, dun dun, dun dun Love it. Yeah. I, say, I would love to see what's on your Lindy Hop playlist. Oh, yeah. Me? I don't have a Lindy. Who's Lindy Hop playlist? <laughs> Yours. Me? Um, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, I don't care about mine. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't really have a Lindy Hop playlist. Awesome. What else you want to ask me? Yeah. And like I said, once we were the Parkettes, we were, we were all over. We were doing shows. Oh, I don't even think that no one's ever mentioned that we did um, a party at um, Nixon's inauguration. We talked a little bit about that um, during Joy's interview. Yeah, or that was the first time we heard that you guys were at the Nixon inauguration. The Nixon inauguration, right? Yeah, we were doing, we danced all over um, for New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. I um, in New York. We were doing shows up in the Catskills. Uh, we were doing the parties at the frat houses. They were giving the parties. We did um, Rutgers University, um, Princeton, Penn State. And we were going to Atlantic City. Atlantic City had a club called Club Harlem, you know, a club where they really had stage and tables, cabarets. Cabarets was really big, you know, they don't really have cabarets around anymore. Um, again, I spent our summer um, six weeks up in Montreal. Montreal had a Club Harlem. I danced at the Club Harlem up in Montreal for six weeks in the summer, one summer. Awesome, awesome. Um, again, note to the audience, if you have any questions, uh, please leave them in the chats. Um, Maxine, I'll ask you, um, so right now, you know, with COVID and quarantine going on, uh, even though, you know, with the vaccines coming out, we do see a slight light to the end of this tunnel, but we are still waiting patiently till we can finally get back on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. What advice or words of encouragement would you give to this, to us waiting at home and this new generation of Lindy Hoppers? Hey, especially if you are quarantining or, or quarantine with your partner, put that music on and dance. Dance, 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 dance. As a matter of fact, last year, I think we were all in shock. <laughs> Because I thought, and I, I, I kid you not, I said, I didn't dance enough last year. I did not dance enough last year. And I am going to dance more this year. I really am. So yeah, just dance, 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 dance your little heart out. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, real quick, who are your favorite dance partners to work with? Oh gosh, uh, I would go back to really my my guys, you know, David Butts. Oh gosh, um, I don't think you got a chance to meet Waco, um, Dicky. Oh my gosh, there's nothing more beautiful. This is um, grammatically correct than to see. I'm gonna put this is the only way to put it. A big guy <laughs> who is light on his feet. Oh my gosh, Dicky! Oh my gosh, you you see him in um, your video. I've seen some of the videos that you had. Dicky, love him dearly. He was a sweetheart, and um, and they motivate you and they push you. You know, and they do this. You can do it. And I'm like, no, I can't do it. Like, yes, you can do it. <laughs> And David, yeah. And my partner, it was Edward. He was, you know, you know, Edward, Edward was real cool, laid back. I think Edward was Dickie's cousin. He, yeah, 
was Dickie's cousin, but David Butts, Waco, um, and Dickie. Awesome. Don't have any partners now, Mike. Uh, she's in. She's watching right now, but she's not with me at the moment. But uh, right now, I got uh, two cats and a dog that I can practice dancing with. <laughs> so I'll do my best with them. Um, all right, we got some more questions coming in now, actually. Okay. Uh, when you first started Lindy Hop, did your tap experience give you a kind of compliment your introduction or give you kind of a leg up over those without any dance experience? Oh, yeah, because I could pick up I quickly. You know, I could learn, you know, throw in, you know, you know how to dance, you, you know how to do. Yeah, it, it helped tremendously. That's why Miss Parks, I, like I said, she drafted me. I didn't even have to say, oh, can I come dance with you guys? Oh, you could dance? Yeah, you know, you want to do this. So mm -hmm. it definitely, it definitely was a plus. Mm -hmm. And I can, you know, you got to have rhythm. And everybody who says they want to dance, everybody don't have rhythm. <laughs> Was there a lot of rhythms that kind of carried over or that you're already kind of used to because of your experience in tap? Like one that either dominated the other? No, rhythm is rhythm, no. Okay. Uh, who are some of the dancers that inspired you the most or that you loved watching the most? Oh my gosh, um, Deborah Youngblood, Deborah Youngblood, um, I just all the old park hits, okay? Just they were, like I said, they just watched these ladies. They were movie stars to us mm -hmm. at that time. Um, they were elegant and they were strong. They, you know, they would be just a Lindy Hop, not for nothing. I heard they were making break dance into a, an Olympic. Lindy Hop could be in the Olympics. Indy, because you had to be strong. Your legs had to be strong. Your upper body had to be strong. And those ladies just ex exude strength. I can see them in my mind now. Crystal is a strong dancer. Um, Crystal is a very strong dancer. She learned from the best. And it would be years before I uh, found out, I, well, of course, now I know that um, Crystal's father was dancing. And I was like, well, no wonder you know how to do that. <laughs> I'm like, what? That's a cheat. You're cheating. No, no. <laughs> she's, she's, she's a really strong dancer. And then, of course, she's learned from the best. Um, and we had a couple of the other ladies um, that were really strong dancers. As I said, everybody brought their own strength to it. You know, I have, I have my part, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> I don't know, sometimes you, oh, it's just like anything in show business. You, you know, you never stop. Even if you miss up, miss a beat step, don't you dare stop. You better catch up and boom, boom. So you better be good in doing something. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we have one question. Um, there are some old, there are some videos on YouTube of uh, some of Mama Lou's uh, workshops that she's taught. And we noticed that there are some really young kids there. I know when, when you started, you were like a, a 15 when you started. Mm -hmm. the, the younger kids that were there, um, it looked like there were some like really young kids, uh, according to the comments, like children. Were they just tagging along or were they part of one of Mama Lou's programs where they're being taught how to dance as well? She had started teaching the younger kids um, to get them prepared for learning the Lindy Hop. Not maybe not necessarily. What she was trying to do was trying to keep the dance style vibrant and alive. Again, because it is rooted in our culturally rooted into our DNA. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she was doing that. It was like you would try to keep um, the young folks now involved into, you know, what other activities you want to keep? Well, just mm, Black history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So yes, she wasn't necessarily trying to train them at that time to go into show business. You know, if that sort of happened as a offspring of, you know, learning, then that's a whole nother story. But it was basically to keep the, the dance alive and then let them be exposed. This is something that we do. And because these kids are not as athletically inclined, you know, phys ed, you know, do these kids still go to gym? I don't know what they do in these phys ed classes anymore. <laughs> so this was a part of them, you know, learning something, especially everyone can be a gymnast, but you can learn how to do this and do some things. Awesome. Uh, we have a question about the kind of, when uh, you talked about the way you were taught Lindy Hop, you uh, used kind of the words, you know, it was less structured, you know, the, the steps, all the steps didn't necessarily have a name. And he says, kind of show you this. All right, let's do this. Where nowadays um, teachers try to kind of structure the classroom a little bit more, um, I guess, in terms of trying to be more accurate with kind of what the names of what they're being taught or even the fact where it's, you know, one teacher in like a circle of students. Do you think uh, that way of that style of teaching or the more modern day of style of teaching kind of affects the way people learn Lindy Hop versus how well, you were taught? It seems that way. We're different people now. You know, we have to teach them the way they're accustomed of being taught. And this seems the way they want to be taught. It's just not throw in, in it's, it's not like throw you in the deep water and see if you can swim. So um, yeah, especially for, um, I, I hate to put the term, cause unless y'all are getting paid for all of this, you know, being amateur dancers, um, professional dancers, and when I say professional dancers, especially at the term the way I'm using it now, these are folks that are really actually performing on Broadway and stuff like that right about now, or performing in shows and stuff like that. Um, that you can throw them in, you know, like, hey, Bob, here, do, this is what we're gonna do. Cause if you're a dancer, you need to know how to do everything. Can you do everything? Like, and when I say, can you do everything? Can I be a ballerina? Can I be a toe dancer? No, I, I can't. So, but if you're doing a dance that anybody who dance, a dancer nowadays should be able to do every genre of dance, except for maybe ballet, since that is just in a whole different ball game, especially, to, you know, when I say ballet, I mean a ballerina, toe dancing. Can everybody do that? No, but if you're a dancer, you pretty much can sort of, should be able to do just about anything. Awesome. All right, so I think we're coming up on time, but I have one okay. last question. Uh, so in the audience that we have here, um, all of us are swing dancers. Uh, we think ourselves, or we hope to be Lindy Hoppers by, uh, by any means of the definition, but many of us are also students, but also teachers. Um, oh, as, cool. as as us that are, you know, that are trying to teach this dance and keep this dance moving forward as authentically as possible, what values would you say are the most important for us to keep alive when it comes to Lindy Hop? Hmm. Values, 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 values. Hmm, to keep alive. Or to make sure are not forgotten or moved or just moved past. Okay, I think you need to have fun. I see when I'm in the classes sometime or I'm watching and maybe if you, and see, now that I'm hearing that some of you are teachers and instructors, and that might be a hindrance because you're, again, there's that structure. So you're trying to say, okay, put the right hand here, put the left hand there, put the right, you know, where 
everything's supposed to really just fall into place. And I'm trying to say what value it is. Um, the value of it is, is just to let, enjoy the dance. Enjoy it and enjoy, that's it. Enjoy what it represents and the time it represents. Transform yourself back into that time and place. And maybe once you transform your body and mind, your mind back there, your body will go and then you will relax and flow with it. Cause what I'm seeing sometime is rigid, robotic, you know, where just, I know you've seen things called zoots, you know, stuff. Maybe before a dance class, you just gotta let the body go. Yeah, let the body go. Take all the robotic out of it and do it this way. And how do you do it? And well, and, and go, yeah. That would be the, the, the value of the, of whence it came the culture and I want to do this some justice. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And maybe to, oh, okay. Don't try to pretend that you're something that you're not. And I'm saying that from being a third place winner, you know, but I'm okay with that. I knew I wasn't the strongest dancer. I know what I know, I can do what I can do. You know, if somebody can do it better and you root them, you help them, you support them and, and vice versa, because that's how we really did all get along. If there was a step I didn't know or I couldn't do. And there may have been a time that I may have to do a certain step just for that one particular show because so-and-so didn't come or something like that. And so, Okay, okay, I did it for this night. So just relax and enjoy it. And don't put all that pressure on yourself of trying to, you know, do it this way, do it that way, and that. Let ride the and ride the music. You ride the music. Let the music lead you. Let the music lead your feet. You know. Sometimes I watch and I can see some of the dancers, some of the um, couples, they are wrestling. They're wrestling with the music. You know, it's like they are, you know, it's like, I feel sorry for them because I know the passion is there. And it's just like, just let it go. Like, relax and listen and, and let the music move, move you. Let the music guide you you know, and ride the music. And for you teachers, you instructors, you know, um, cause the really the whole technical part of it is if you want to use that term, the air steps and the air, and, and that's it. The lippy hop is the, air, um, the acrobatics. Without the acrobatics, you only doing swing dance. So doing the acrobatics, you want to do them and you want to do them correct. You want to do them right. You want to do them, get the best um, height and, and presentation out of them, but you want to do them safe. So now that's where you really give the concentration at. But at that point on, it's a free for all. And that's what Lindy is. Lindy, and if you ever watch, like you say, you watch the old movies, that's why you see everybody's just, woo! Cause it's a free for all. You gotta remember that it was a time. Okay, I'll tell you another way to think about it. Because on the weekends, going back in the days, came back Friday night, the OJs had a song. Y'all listen to that um, song, um, OJs, as uh, it's Friday, I think. Pull, yeah, pull it up on it there, it's Friday night. And so, oh, it's Friday, living for the weekend. Listen to that song. I'm gonna tell all y'all, listen to that song, listen, living for the weekend. And cause that's how it was. 
Friday night, I just got paid. I'm just gonna go out and have a good time. And so everything was just free and relaxed and the dance and that's how the dance was, is and always shall, should be. I'm just free and relaxed, go with the flow and you will be better Lindy dancers once you just, you know, relax, ride the music. Stop awesome. trying to be, do it this way. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Maxine. Um, <laughs> I can uh, for one say that just based off of your stories and the values you're getting across, um, I think everyone here can take away from this just a bunch of different ways that we can try and, like you said, just do justice to the stance and just keep it fun. Uh, thank you so much. Um, can everyone please unmute themselves? Give uh, Ms. Maxine Simmons a round of applause. Woo! Oh, hey. Hi, all you people. <laughs> hey, everyone. Oh, oh, yeah. Ma Maxine's on her phone right now. She can only see one of us at a time. So. No, I can <laughs> see a couple of y'all at a time. <laughs> I can see quite a few. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Hi, Gene. Oh, there's my son. Hi, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this was, I, I got to thank you, um, Mike, for inviting me. Um, yeah, this was really good. And I look forward to working with Crystal. You know, I'm so proud of her. Um, I was really proud of her when I heard her. She and like, Crystal, dance school. I'm like, whoa, this is great. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to um working when we all get out of this and we all can dance again but going for it we've got to keep dancing everybody put that music on and and dance like no one's watching that's right you guys are in there and you are have your fortunate enough to have your dancing partner there put that music on and just dance just just dance 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 put on all kind of music Salsa, you know, yeah, yep, yep, hip hop and stuff, and just, 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 just go dance. Just dance. I know mm. I'm gonna do some more dancing this year. I know that you sure are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did everybody, uh, 